Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Bryce. And today I want to continue our discussion about secret combinations. In our last video, we talked about that they have mastered a secret, that they know a secret. Satan has a secret, and he shares it with anyone that follows him. And that secret is how to turn life into money, how to control, rob, and murder, because they have mastered that secret. But I do want to come back to that they do things in secret. Clearly, secret combinations operate in secret. And there's the problem. How do you combat, combat an organization that is operating in secret? I remind you that Mormon wrote in Helaman about Kishkumen and his band. In Helaman chapter 1, after Kishkumen escapes, he gathers his forces and they enter into a covenant swearing by their everlasting maker that they would tell no man that Kishkumen had murdered Pehoran. So they keep a secret. We've seen that they've mastered a secret. Now they keep a secret. And then notice in verse 12, they did mingle themselves among the people. So we see that they operate in secret. So how do we combat an enemy who keeps everything secret and operates in secret? They mingle among us. They're all around us and we don't know who they are because they keep it a secret. They operate in secret. So today I want to share with you one of the great aha moments of my study of Helaman. I should probably tell you that story. I remember vividly when it dawned on me that Helaman was a pattern of our day. When third Nephi, as I started to see the coming of Christ to America is almost an exact duplicate of what's going to happen at his second coming to the world, that his first coming was a pattern of his second coming. And then I remember vividly that the spirit impressed me powerfully that one of the things that is implied in that is that the days before his coming, in other words, the book of Helaman, is a pattern of our day. We're living in the days of Helaman. And one of the very best ways to understand how to navigate the latter days prior to the second coming is to study Helaman. I remember vividly when that hit me like a ton of bricks. I became obsessed with the book of Helaman. I couldn't think of anything else. I was so driven to understand that book like I never have before. I read it 17 times in two months. In fact, one time I read it backwards. I read the chapters in reverse order thinking maybe if I started at the end, it would show me something that I normally don't get when I start at the beginning, kind of like watching a movie again, and all of a sudden you notice subtle little hints that you didn't notice when you didn't know the ending, but now that you do know the ending, you notice those hints. I was hoping that if I read Helaman in reverse order, I would catch some of those more quickly. But I was obsessed with the book of Helaman. I read it so much and thought about it so much. And then in the middle of that obsession, one of the biggest aha moments I've ever had was when I realized the answer to that question. How do you combat an enemy that operates in secret? Let me show you what I saw. If you have been a student of the Book of Mormon for a while, you know about how long it takes Mormon to write a story. You kind of have an, an expectation. I know how long Mormon takes to tell a particular story. Most of his stories are about the length of a modern day chapter. Now, I know that that's not how we started. The Book of Mormon didn't have the same chaptering. But still, the Mormon stories are about the length of a chapter. Even those war chapters, that's not one long story. Those are several smaller stories that take about a chapter. For example, how Amalekiah becomes king of the Lamanites. Uh, the, the first battle at Noah. Or the conflict between Lehi and Morianton. Or the kingmen. 
or the story of the stripling warriors coming forward to preserve the covenant that their fathers made, or the battle that included the stripling warriors running in front of the city, the letter to Pehoran. All of those stories within the war chapters take about a chapter. So you kind of get a feel for how Mormon tells a story. So I'm reading the middle of Helaman, and all of a sudden I realize this is a really long story. Let me, let me show you. Here are the chapters of Helaman. This is just my gospel library, and here are the 16 chapters of Helaman. Right in the middle of the book of Helaman is a story that takes three chapters to tell. Chapter 7, 8, and 9 of Helaman are really one very long story. Helaman tells it in greater detail than normal. It's the story of Nephi praying in his garden. The people gather. He kind of chides with them. He says, go, you know, it's already at your doors. Uh, your chief judge is dead. Send someone and you'll see that the chief judge is dead. So then they run and they find Sazoram, the chief judge, lying dead, just like Nephi predicted. So then they conclude that Nephi had something to do with it. So they come, Nephi, you're a confederate. Tell us what happened. Confess. Nephi says, oh, you fools. Go to the house of Seantum, the brother of Sezorum. Ask him if I, Nephi, the pretended prophet, had anything to do with this. He'll say no. Ask him if he killed his brother. He'll say no. Then examine his clothing. You'll find blood on his clothing. He'll get nervous. Ask him where the blood came from. He will confess that he killed Sezorum, his brother. And then he will tell you that I, Nephi, had nothing to do with it. And they run. And they do, ex and it, they do exactly as Nephi says, and that's exactly what happened. Now, it didn't take me very long to summarize the story. I think Mormon could have told it a little quicker than he did. So I'm reading this story, and I ask myself, this is a really long story. Why is Mormon taking so long to tell this story? And then it dawns on me. The story is the answer. It's not what Nephi said. It's not what happened. It's the story that's the answer. Prophets see through the secrets that's the point of the story. And the fact that it, to me, the fact that Mormon took so long to tell that story, right in the, in the book of Helaman, that is so critical. The real estate in Helaman is critical because it's a commentary on our day. Why would Mormon take three chapters to tell that story if he's not waving his arms saying, do you understand the solution, the way you combat an enemy that is hiding in secret, the way you combat all of the secrets is to have a seer who sees through the secrets. That was one of the great insights of my life. Just the power of this outflowing, this aha, powerful flowing moment where the Lord just said, Brash, everything's going to be fine. You have prophets, seers, and revelators who see through the secrets. And they'll let you know. I thought instantly about that conversation that Ammon had with Limhi. Do you remember when Ammon was sent to find Limhi? And Limhi asks him, Hey, you know, we've got these 24 gold plates, but they're written in a language that no one knows. Is there anyone back in Zarahemla who can translate? And Ammon says, yes, most assured. In fact, let's read it. 
Mosiah chapter 8, verse 13, Ammon said unto him, I can assuredly tell thee, O king, of a man who can translate the records, for he has wherewith he can look and translate all records that are of ancient date. And it is a gift from God, and the things are called interpreters. Then he says at the very end of that verse that whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called a seer. We have a seer back in Zarahemla. He can see. Limhi says, a seer must, is greater than a prophet. Ammon says, no, king, a seer is a prophet. A seer is a revelator and a prophet also. And we sustain the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve as prophets, seers, and revelators. And then Ammon tells Limhi what seers can see. And I love this list. He starts with an interesting one. Notice in verse 17, but seers can know of things that are past. And over the course of the restoration, we have had prophets, seers, and revelators who on occasion saw something very significant in the past. And also things which are to come. I think that one is blown out of proportion by the world. When I talk to non-members, especially kind of critical non-members about the fact that, the, you know, the restoration of the gospel, they always kind of mockingly say, well, what has your prophet predicted? What has your prophet seen in the future? And that's kind of the image they have in their, their mind that prophets predict the future. And I acknowledge that, yes, they see things to come. But notice the rest of this verse. And I remind you that the Lord emphasizes by repetition. Watch what he's emphasizing about what prophets see. And by them shall things be revealed, or rather shall secret things be made manifest. Notice the repetition. And hidden things shall come to light. So prophets see secret things, and hidden things, and things which are not known. Prophets see what isn't known. In fact, I love the last one. Prophets see what otherwise could not be known. Now that's a magnificent list. And I wish we could just shout that from the rooftops. Prophets, seers, and revelators see secret things, hidden things, things which aren't known and things which can't be known. Do you remember in Abraham chapter three where Abraham was shown the cosmos? He was taken on a tour and shown the universe. He saw Kolob, the star closest to Heavenly Father's residence. Now, there is no physical way that anyone on this planet could go see Kolob, but Abraham saw Kolob. He saw what cannot be known. Prophets see what isn't known, secret things, hidden things, things which no man knows. That is the great truth we don't need to be afraid of any secret as long as we have someone who can see through the secrets. Now, all of this is because the Lord sees through the secrets and he's the one that warns. He's the one that says, you need to leave New York. Joseph Smith was told, leave New York, go to Ohio. And then later he was told, Doctrine and Covenants 38, verse 13, Now I show unto you a mystery, a thing which is had in secret chambers, to bring to pass even your destruction in process of time, and ye knew it not. But the Lord knew, and he warns. That's why we have prophets, seers, and revelators. Their job is to see through the secrets. They see what is hidden. They see what no man knows and they see what no man can know. But here's the challenge. They see 
we don't. What usually happens in your experience, what usually happens when you see something and a friend doesn't, or when you see something and your children don't? How does that communication usually go? Do you remember how it went in the days of Enoch when he saw a flood coming and destruction and danger and no one else could see it? They called him a wild man. And there's the danger. Prophets, seers, and revelators see what we don't see. And if you trust in what you see, you're going to blow them off. You have to have faith that they see something. They see through the secrets. They see the hidden things. And I'm going to trust what they see. Let me give you an example. I know I've used it in the past, but let me give you what I think is the great example in the Book of Mormon. I remind you that Samuel the layman, as he stood upon the wall, saw the destruction of Zarahemla. And he says to them in Zarahemla, Blessed are they who will repent, for them I will spare. But behold, if it were not for the righteous who are in this great city... Behold, I would cause that fire should come down out of heaven and destroy it. But behold, it is for the righteous sake that it is spared. But behold, the time cometh, saith the Lord, that when ye shall cast out the righteous from among you, then shall ye be ripe for destruction. Yea, woe unto this great city because of the wickedness and abominations which are in her. In other words, Samuel the Lamanite says, I see fire coming. Fire is going to destroy this city. But it's not doing it right now because of the righteous. If you kick the righteous out, the fire's coming. But now turn to 3 Nephi chapter 8 when the destruction comes. In verse 8, the city of Zarahemla did take fire. Just like Samuel the Lamanite saw. So what happened to the righteous? Were they cast out? Did they leave on their own? The prophecy was fulfilled. If the righteous go, this city's going to burn. And that city burned. So what happened to the righteous? Well, we get a hint two chapters later in chapter 10. 3 Nephi 10 verse 12. It was the more righteous part of the people who were saved. It was they who had received the prophets and not stoned them. They received the prophets. Now, let's see if we can connect those dots. It sure seems like at some point, a prophet came to Zarahemla and said, you need to leave. You need to get out. And the righteous left. And once the righteous left, the prophecy was fulfilled and the city was burned. But a prophet came and warned and they left. Now, let me add one more important detail. The day in which prophets warn is not the day of fire. There was no fire when the prophet came to warn. There's an interesting verse when the Lord is explaining why the Jackson County saints were removed from their lands. He said in section 101 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 7 and 8, They were slow to hearken unto the voice of the Lord their God. Therefore, the Lord their God is slow to hearken unto their prayers, to answer them in the day of their trouble. In the day of their peace, they esteemed lightly my counsel. But in the day of their trouble, of necessity, they feel after me. He speaks of two days, a day of peace and a day of trouble. It is my testimony that prophets speak in the day of peace. There was no rain in the sky when Noah said, get on the boat. There was no fire in Zarahemla when the prophet said, get out. That was a day of peace. When the day of trouble came, the door to the ark was locked. The fire in Zarahemla came too quickly and you were destroyed if you waited until the day of fire. 
It is my testimony that prophets speak in a day of peace when we don't see what they see. That's why they're seers. They see secret things, hidden things, things what no one can see, things which no one can know. They see and we don't. Therefore, we have to trust and we have to get out of Zarahemla when there's no fire in the sky. I testify that there is nothing coming in the latter days that you and I need to be worried about. There is no secret combination that can destroy us. There is nothing done in secret that won't be revealed by someone who sees through the secrets. I am grateful to be led by prophets, seers, and revelators who see through the secrets. As you read the book of Helaman, notice how long Mormon takes to tell that story and ask yourself, why is he taking so much time to tell this story? In this setting, the days that are a pattern of our day, isn't he emphasizing and testifying that prophets see through the secrets? I leave you my witness. I am so grateful to live in a day where prophets see through the secrets. May we trust in the day of peace what we don't see, is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.